He tried to keep down his excitement, for the Chu Yankel, innkeeper and tenant of all the mills on the estate, was a Polish patriot, and in a still lower voice, I was already a married man when the French and all the other nations passed this way with Napoleon. Tss, tss. That was a great harvest for death. Perhaps this time God will help. The prince nodded. Perhaps. And falling into deep meditation, he let his horse take him home. That night he wrote a letter and early in the morning sent a mounted express to the post town. During the day he came out of his taciturnity to the great joy of the family circle and conversed with his father of recent events, the revolt in Warsaw, the flight of the Grand Duke Constantine, the first slight successes of the Polish army, at that time there was a Polish army, the risings in the province, old Prince John moved and uneasy, speaking from a purely aristocratic point of view, mistrusted the popular origins of the movement, regretted its democratic tendencies, and did not believe in the possibility of success. He was sad, inwardly agitated. I am judging all this calmly. There are secular principles of legitimacy and order which have been violated in this reckless enterprise for the sake of most subversive illusions, though of course the patriotic impulses of the heart. Prince Roman had listened in a thoughtful attitude. He took advantage of the pause to tell his father quietly that he had sent that morning a letter to St. Petersburg, resigning his commission in the guards. The old prince remained silent. He thought that he ought to have been consulted. His son was also ordnance officer to the emperor, and he knew that the Tsar would never forget this appearance of defection on a Polish noble. In a discontented tone, he pointed out to his son that, as it was, he had an unlimited leave. The right thing would have been to keep quiet. They had too much tact at court to recall a man of his name. Or, at worst, some distant mission might have been asked for, to the caucus, for instance, away from this unhappy struggle which was wrong in principle and therefore destined to fail. Presently you shall find yourself without any interest in life and without no occupation, and you shall need something to occupy you, my poor boy. You have acted rashly, I fear. Prince Roman murmured. I thought it better. His father faltered under his steady gaze. Well, well, perhaps, but as ordnance officer, to the emperor, and in favor with all the imperial family. Those people had never been heard of when our house was already illustrious, the young man let fall disdainfully. This was the sort of remark to which the old prince was sensible. Well, perhaps it is better, he conceded at last. The father and son parted affectionately for the night. The next day, Prince Roman seemed to have fallen back into the depths of his indifference. He rode out as usual. He remembered that the day before he had seen a reptile-like convoy of soldiery, bristling with bayonets, crawling over the face of that land which was his. The woman he loved had been his too. Death had robbed him of her. Her loss had been to him a moral shock. It had opened his heart to a greater sorrow, his mind to a vaster thought, his eyes to all the past and to the existence of another love fraught with pain, but as mysteriously imperative as that one lost to which he had entrusted his happiness. That evening he retired earlier than usual and rang for his personal servant. Go and see if there is light yet in the quarters of the master of the horse. If he is still up, ask him to come and speak to me. While the servant was absent on this errand, the prince tore up hastily some papers, 
locked the drawers of his desk, and hung a medallion containing the miniature of his wife round his neck against his breast. The man the prince was expecting belonged to that past which the death of his love had called to life. He was of a family of small nobles who for generations had been adherents, servants, and friends of the prince's S. He remembered the times before the last partition and had taken part in the struggles of the last hour. He was a typical old Pole of that class, with a great capacity for emotion, for blind enthusiasm, with martial instincts and simple beliefs, and even with the old-time habit of larding his speech with Latin words, and his kindly shrewd eyes, his ruddy face, his lofty brow, and his thick, gray, pendant mustache were also very typical of his kind. Listen, Master Francis, the prince said familiarly and without preliminaries. Listen, old friend, I am going to vanish from here quietly. I go where something louder than my grief, and yet something with a voice very like it calls me. I confide in you alone. You will say what's necessary when the time comes. The old man understood. He extended his hands, and trembling exceedingly. But as soon as he found his voice, he thanked God aloud for letting him live long enough to see the descendant of the illustrious family, in its youngest generation, give an example of the love of his country and of valor in the field. He doubted not of his dear prince attaining a place in council and in war worthy of his high birth. He was already that in that kind of family. At the end of the speech he burst into tears and fell into the prince's arms. The prince quieted the old man, and when he had him seated in an armchair and comparatively composed, he said, Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Francis. You know how I loved my wife. A loss like that opens one's eyes to unsuspected truths. There is no question here of leadership and glory. I mean to go alone and to fight obscurely in the ranks. I am going to offer my country what is mine to offer, that is my life, as simply as the saddler from Grodek, who went through yesterday with his apprentices. The old man cried out at this. That could never be. He could not allow it. He could not allow it. But he had to give way before the arguments and the express will of the prince. Ha! Huh. If you say that it is a matter of feeling and conscience, so be it. But you cannot go utterly alone. Alas, that I am too old to be of any use. My dear prince, at the thought that I am over seventy and of no more account in the world than a cripple in the church porch saddens me. It seems that to sit at home and pray to God for the nation and for you is all I am fit for. But there is my son, my youngest son, Peter. He will make a worthy companion for you, and as it happens, he's staying with me here. There has not been for ages a Prince S. hazarding his life without a companion of our name to ride by his side. You, somebody who knows who you are, if only to let your parents and your old servant hear what is happening to you. And when does your princely mightiness mean to start? In an hour, said the prince, and the old man hurried off to warn his son. Prince Roman took up a candlestick and walked quietly along a dark corridor in the silent house. The head nurse said afterwards that waking up suddenly, she saw the prince looking at his child, one hand shading the light from his eyes. He stood and gazed at her for some time, and then putting the candlestick on the floor, bent over the cot, and kissed lightly the little girl who did not wake. He went out noiselessly, taking the light away with him. She saw his face perfectly well, but she could read nothing of his purpose in it. It was pale, but perfectly calm, 
and after he turned away from the cot, he never looked back at it once. The only other trusted person, besides the old man and his son Peter, was the Jew Yankel. When he asked the prince where precisely he wanted to be guided, the prince answered, to the nearest party. A grandson of the Jew, a lanky youth, conducted the two young men by little-known paths across woods and morasses, and led them in sight of the few fires of a small detachment camped in a hollow. Some invisible horses neighed. A voice in the dark cried, Who goes there? And the young Jew departed hurriedly, explaining that he must make haste home to be in time for keeping the Sabbath. Thus humbly, and in accord with the simplicity of the vision of duty, he saw, when death had removed the brilliant bandage of happiness from his eyes, did Prince Roman bring his offering to his country. His companion made himself known as the son of the master of the house to the prince's S, and declared him to be a relation, a distant cousin from the same parts as himself, as people presumed, of the same name. In truth, no one inquired much. Two more young men, clearly of the right sort, had joined. Nothing more natural. Prince Roman did not remain long in the south. One day, while scouting with several others, they were ambushed near the entrance of a village by some Russian infantry. The first charge laid low a good many, and the rest scattered in all directions. The Russians, too, did not stay, being afraid of a return in force. After some time, the peasants coming to view the scene extricated Prince Roman from under his dead horse. He was unhurt, but his faithful companion had been one of the first to fall. The prince helped the peasants to bury him and the other dead. Then alone, not certain where to find the body of partisans which was constantly moving about in all directions, he resolved to try and join the main Polish army facing the Russians on the borders of Lithuania. Disguised in peasant clothes, in case of meeting some marauding Cossacks, he wandered a couple of weeks before he came upon a village occupied by a regiment of Polish cavalry on outpost duty. On a bench before a peasant hut of a better sort sat an elderly officer whom he took for the colonel. The prince approached respectfully, told his story shortly, and stated his desire to enlist, and when asked his name by the officer, who had been looking at him over carefully, he gave on the spur of the moment the name of his dead companion. The elderly officer thought to himself, here's the son of some peasant proprietor of the liberated class. He liked his appearance. And can you read and write, my good fellow, he asked. Yes, your honor, I can, said the prince. Good. Come along inside the hut. The regimental adjutant is there. He will enter your name and administer the oath to you. The adjutant stared very hard at the newcomer, but said nothing. When all the forms had been gone through and the recruit gone out, he turned to his superior officer. Do you know who that is? Who? That Peter? A likely chap. That's Prince Roman. Nonsense. But the adjutant was positive. He had seen the prince several times, about two years before, in the castle in Warsaw. He had even spoken to him once at a reception of officers held by the Grand Duke. He's changed. He seems much older, but I am certain of my man. I have a good memory for faces. The two officers looked at each other in silence. He's sure to be recognized sooner or later, murmured the adjutant. The colonel shrugged his shoulders. It's no affair of ours. If he has a fancy to serve in the ranks, as to being recognized, it's not so likely. All our officers and men come from the other end of Poland. He meditated gravely for a while, then smiled. He told me he could read and write. There's nothing to prevent me making him a sergeant at the first opportunity. He's sure to shape up all, all right. Prince Roman, as a non-commissioned officer, surpassed the colonel's expectations. 
Before long, Sergeant Peter became famous for his resourcefulness and courage. It was not the reckless courage of a desperate man. It was a self-possession, as if conscientious valor, which nothing could dismay, a boundless but equable devotion, unaffected by time, by reverses, by the discouragement of endless retreats, by the bitterness of waning hopes and the horrors of pestilence added to the toils and perils of war. It was in this year that the cholera made its first appearance in Europe. It devastated the camps of both armies, affecting the firmest minds with the terror of a mysterious death, stalking silently between the piled-up arms and around the bivouacked fires. A sudden shriek would wake up the harassed soldiers, and they would see in the glow of embers one of themselves writhe on the ground like a worm trodden on by an invisible foot, and before the dawn broke he would be stiff and cold. Parties so visited have been known to rise like one man, abandon the fire and run off into the night in mute panic or a comrade talking to you on the march would stammer suddenly in the middle of a sentence, roll affrighted eyes, and fall down with distorted face and blue lips, breaking the ranks with the convulsions of his agony. Men were struck in the saddle, on sentry duty, in the firing line, carrying orders, serving the guns. I have been told that a battalion forming under fire with perfect steadiness for the assault of a village, three cases occurred within five minutes at the head of the column, and the attack could not be delivered because the leading companies scattered all over the fields like chaff before the wind. Sergeant Peter, young as he was, had a great influence over his men. It was said that the number of desertions in the squadron in which he served was less than in any other in the whole of that cavalry division. Such was supposed to be the compelling example of one man's quiet intrepidity in facing every form of danger and terror. However that may be, he was liked and trusted generally. When the end came and the remnants of that army corps, heart-pressed on all sides, were preparing to cross the Prussian frontier, Sergeant Peter had enough influence to rally round him a score of troopers. He managed to escape with them at night from the hemmed-in army. He led this band through 200 miles of country, covered by numerous Russian detachments and ravaged by the cholera. But this was not to avoid captivity, to go into hiding and try to save themselves. No, he led them into a fortress which was still occupied by the Poles, and where the last stand of the vanquished revolution was to be made. This looks like mere fanaticism, but fanaticism is human. Man has adored ferocious divinities. There is ferocity in every passion, even in love itself. The religion of undying hope resembles the mad cult of despair, of death, of annihilation. The difference lies in the moral motives springing from the secret needs and the unexpressed aspiration of the believers. It is only to vain men that all is vanity, and all is deception only to those who have never been sincere with themselves. It was in the fortress that my grandfather found himself together with Sergeant Peter. My grandfather was a neighbor of the S. family in the country, but he did not know Prince Roman, who, however, knew his name perfectly well. The prince introduced himself one night as they both sat on the ramparts, leaning against a gun carriage. The service he wished to ask for was, in case of his being killed, to have the intelligence conveyed to his parents. They talked in low tones, the other servants of the peace lying about near them. My grandfather gave the required promise, and then asked frankly, for he was greatly interested by the disclosure so unexpectedly made. But tell me, Prince, 
Why this request? Have you any evil forebodings as to yourself? Not in the least. I was thinking of my people. They have no idea where I am, answered Prince Roman. I'll engage to do as much for you, if you like. It's certain that half of us at least shall be killed before the end, so there's an even chance one of us surviving the other. My grandfather told him where, as he supposed, his wife and children were then. From that moment till the end of the siege, the two were much together. On the day of the great assault, my grandfather received a severe wound. The town was taken. Next day, the citadel itself, its hospital full of dead and dying, its magazines empty, its defenders having burnt their last cartridge, opened its gates. During all the campaign, the prince, exposing his person, conscientiously on every occasion, had not received a scratch. No one had recognized him, or at any rate had betrayed his identity. Till then, as long as he did his duty, it mattered nothing who he was. Now, however, the position was changed. As ex-guardsman and as late ordnance officer of the emperor, this rebel ran a serious risk of being given special attention in the shape of a firing squad at ten paces. For more than a month he remained lost in the miserable crowd of prisoners, packed in the casements of the citadel. With just enough food to keep body and soul together, but otherwise allowed to die from wounds, privation, and disease at the rate of forty or so a day. The position of the fortress being central, new parties, captured in the open in the course of a thorough pacification, were being sent in frequently. Among such newcomers, there happened to be a young man, a personal friend of the prince from his school days. He recognized him, and in the extremity of his dismay cried aloud, My God, Roman, you are here! It is said that years of life embittered by remorse paid for this momentary lack of self-control. All this happened in the main quadrangle of the citadel. The warning gesture of the prince came too late. An officer of the gendarmes on guard had heard the exclamation. The incident appeared to him worth inquiring into. The investigation which followed was not very arduous because the prince, asked categorically for his real name, owned up to it. The intelligence of the prince being found amongst the prisoners was sent to St. Petersburg. His parents were already there living in sorrow, incertitude, and apprehension. The capital of the empire was the safest place to reside in for a noble whose son had disappeared so mysteriously from home in a time of rebellion. The old people had not heard from him or of him for months. They took care not to contradict the rumors of suicide from despair circulating in the great world, which remembered the interesting love match, the charming and frank happiness brought to an end by death. But they hoped secretly that their son survived and that he had been able to cross the frontier with that part of the army which had surrendered to the Prussians. The news of his captivity was a crushing blow. Directly, nothing could be done for him. But the greatness of their name, of their position, their wide relations, and connections in the highest spheres enabled his parents to act indirectly, and they moved heaven and earth, as the saying is, to save their son from the consequences of his madness, as poor Prince John did not hesitate to express himself. Great personages were approached by society leaders, high dignitaries were interviewed, powerful officials were induced to take an interest in that affair. The help of every possible secret influence was enlisted. Some private secretaries got heavy bribes. The mistress of a certain senator obtained a large sum of money. But as I have said, in such a glaring case, no direct appeal could be made and no open steps taken. All that could be done was to incline, by private representation, the mind of the 
president of the military commission to the side of clemency, he ended by being impressed by the hints and suggestions, some of the many from very high quarters, which he received from St. Petersburg, and after all, the gratitude of such great nobles as the S. family was something worth having from a worldly point of view. He was a good Russian, but he was also a good-natured man. Moreover, the hate of the Poles was not, at that time, a cardinal article of patriotic creed, as it became some thirty years later. He felt well disposed at first sight towards that young man, bronzed, thin-faced, worn out by months of hard campaigning, the hardships of the siege, and the rigors of captivity. The commission was composed of three officers. It sat in the citadel in a bare, vaulted room behind a long black table. Some clerks occupied the two ends, and besides the gendarmes who brought in the prince, there was no one else there. Within those four sinister walls, shutting out from him all the sights and sounds of liberty, all hopes of the future, all consoling illusions, alone in the face of his enemies erected for judges, who can tell how much love of life there was in Prince Roman, how much remained in the sense of duty revealed to him in sorrow, how much of his awakened love of his native country, that country which demands to be loved as no other country has ever been loved, with the mournful affection one bears to the unforgotten dead, and with the in unextinguishable fire of a hopeless passion which only a living, breathing, warming, warm ideal can kindle in our breasts for our pride, for our weariness, for our exaltation, for our undoing. This is something monstrous in the thought of such an exaction till it stands before us embodied in the shape of a fidelity without fear and without reproach. Nearing the supreme moment of his life, the prince could have had the feeling that it was about to end. He answered the questions put to him clearly, concisely, with the most profound indifference. After all those tense months of action, to talk was a weariness to him, but he concealed it, lest his foes should suspect in his manner the apathy of discouragement or the numbness of a crushed spirit. The details of his conduct could have no importance one way or another. With his thoughts these men had nothing to do. He preserved a scrupulous, courteous tone. He had refused the permission to sit down. What happened at this preliminary examination is only known from the presiding officer. Pursuing the only uh, possible course in that glaringly bad case, he tried from the first to bring to the prince's mind the line of defense he wished him to take. He absolutely framed his questions so as to put the right answers in the culprit's mouth, going so far as to suggest the very words, how distracted by excessive grief after his young wife's death, rendered irresponsible for his conduct by despair and a moment of blind recklessness without realizing the highly reprehensible nature of the act, nor yet its danger and its dishonor. He went off to join the nearest rebels on a sudden impulse, and that now penitently. But Prince Roman was silent. The military judges looked at him hopefully. In silence, he reached for a pen and wrote on a sheet of paper he found under his hand, I join the national rising from conviction. He pushed the paper across the table. The president took it up, showed it in turn to his two colleagues sitting to the right and left, then looked fixedly at Prince Roman, let it fall from his hand, and the silence remained unbroken till he spoke to the gendarmes, ordering them to remove the prisoner. Such was the written testimony of Prince Roman in the supreme moment of his life. I have heard that the princes of the S family and all its branches adopted the last two words, from conviction, for the device under the 
armorial bearings of their house. I don't know whether the report is true, but my uncle could not tell me. He remarked only that naturally it was not to be seen on Prince Roman's own seal. He was condemned for life to Siberian mines. Emperor Nicholas, who always took personal cognizance of all sentences on Polish nobility, wrote with his own hand in the margin, The authorities are severely warned to take care that this convict walks in chains like any other criminal every step of the way. It was a sentence of deferred death. Very few survived entombment in these mines for more than three years. Yet, as he was reported as still alive at the end of that time, he was allowed on a petition of his parents, and by way of exceptional grace, to serve as common soldier in the caucus. All communication with him was forbidden. He had no civil rights. For all practical purposes, except that of suffering, he was a dead man. The little child he had been so careful not to wake up when he kissed her in her cot inherited all the fortune after Prince John's death. Her existence saved those immense estates from confiscation. It was twenty-five years before Prince Roman, stone deaf, his health broken, was permitted to return to Poland. His daughter married splendidly to a Polish-Austrian Grand Seigneur, and, moving in the cosmopolitan sphere of the highest European aristocracy, lived mostly abroad in Nice and Vienna. He, settling down on one of her estates, not the one with the palatial residence, but another where there was a modest little house, saw very little of her. But Prince Roman did not shut himself up as if his work were done. There was hardly anything done in the private and public life of the neighborhood in which Prince Roman's advice and assistance were not called upon, and never in vain. It was well said that his days did not belong to himself, but to his fellow citizens, and especially he was the particular friend of all returned exiles, helping them with purse and advice, arranging their affairs, and finding them means of livelihood. I heard from my uncle many tales of his devoted activity, in which he was always guided by a simple wisdom, a high sense of honor, and the most scrupulous conception of private and public probity. He remains a living figure for me because of that meeting in a billiard room, when, in my anxiety to hear about a particularly wolfish wolf, I came in momentary contact with a man who was preeminently a man amongst all men capable of feeling deeply, of believing steadily, of loving ardently. I remember to this day the grasp of Prince Roman's bony, wrinkled hand, closing on my small, inky paw, and my uncle's half-serious, half-amused way of looking down at his trespassing nephew. They moved on and forgot that little boy, but I did not move. I gazed after them, not so much disappointed as disconcerted by this prince, so utterly unlike a prince in any fairy tale. They moved very slowly across the room. Before reaching the other door, the prince stopped, and I heard him, I seem to hear him now, saying, I wish you would write to Vienna about filling up that post. He's a most deserving fellow, and your recommendation would be decisive. My uncle's face turned to him expressed genuine wonder. It said, as plainly as any speech could say, what better recommendation than a father's can be needed. The prince was quick at reading expressions. Again he spoke with the toneless accent of a man who has not heard his own voice for years, for whom the soundless world is like an abode of silent shades. And to this day, I remember the very words, I ask you because, you see, my daughter 
and my son-in-law don't believe me to be a good judge of men. They think that I let myself be guided too much by mere sentiment.